Welcome to the Your Town Television Program. My name is Jeff Klein, your host for this segment that's hosted by the Naval Postgraduate School Foundation, where we bring you interesting faculty and students and the research they're doing in our local area. In this segment, uh, we're going to highlight Dr. Don Brutzman. Welcome, Don, to the show. Thank you, Jeff. Now, uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about everyone's past or history, just to understand the diverse uh, talent that the NPS brings to the local community. So uh, you didn't start out as an academic. You actually started off as a submariner in the Navy. How did you join the Navy, and why did you join the Navy? Well, uh, it was fascinating for me because I didn't know what to do in high school. I, they gave me some kind of aptitude test, you know, <laughs> would you like this or that? And the counselor said, Don, we got real problems with you because you seem to like everything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I ended up, I went to the Naval Academy. Now, how did, did you have family who go there before? Or? No, I had not. Uh, so what dad, inspired you to apply? My dad was in Korea, okay. which, uh, you know, that's still playing out, his, his hard yeah. work there. That war's but, not over yet. That's <laughs> right, that's right. And uh, uh, But Naval Academy looked great because a strong engineering program, and it was applied. It had right. the Navy, and I wanted to do that. So I was pretty sure once I got started that submarines was a place so uh, well now where did you where were you from originally New Jersey okay so that was not far from the Naval Academy that's then. right we right. got to see it and uh, uh, they have students of course from all over the right. country they they like to kid that there's uh, 40,000 trying to get in and 4,000 trying to get out <laughs> so uh, uh, I enjoyed it very much there but uh, submarines became my focus because they have so much going on in one place and that's where I got to scratch that itch of well you're interested in too many things now what and that that was a place for me so what focused you at the Naval Academy to consider that was it nuclear power which all submariners have to be or was the fact just the submarine force in general just the uh, well the engineering getting into that first is an electrical engineering and uh, so you were an electrical th engineering undergrad correct okay and uh, uh, you're just immersed in all the services uh, all the branches in the Navy, the other services there, and so the the discipline, the the importance of the mission, mm -hmm. uh, the community, uh, and and the chance to excel as a young person is really appealing for the Navy. I think for anybody, and I, I I'm happy to commend it to anybody. Great, because of those opportunities. So you 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 graduated with an E degree. You went. To, you were selected for submarines. You had to go to Nuke Power School. Correct. Then you had to go to sub school. What yep. was your first boat? First boat was the George C. Marshall. Oh. Uh, 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 patience, not weakness, <laughs> uh, was uh, the good general's uh, motto. But I, I, I got to do a, a midshipman cruise before that on oh, the okay. USS Shark, which was so you got a little taste of it. Yeah, it was great. Sure. Sports car of the fleet. Uh, that was a small boat, and it had an interesting property where, if you, as soon as you got to 20 knots, suddenly you were going 22 knots because it would plane <laughs> across the surface. So, uh, yeah, they're big, hundreds of tons, but uh, sometimes driven like sports cars. Now, so. where was uh, uh, Marshall uh, actually homeported? Marshall was homeported uh, out of Holy Lock, Scotland oh, when okay. I was there. Right. And, uh, of course, two crews. Uh, the right, so it was a strategic uh, ballistic missile submarine. Exactly right, right. a very right. important mission. And uh, because of that, they want those boats to be able to do that mission as much as possible. That's an interesting... Uh, trick for a crew to give up their ship to some to other people crew. and walk away. So, so now uh, in the three months that you were off, were you actually in Holy Lock or did you fly back to the United States? They flew States? us back to Groton. Okay, Groton. Groton, Connecticut. Right. And so we did our, a lot of off, off crew training right. and um, uh, qualification and schools and so forth. Well, did you have a follow-on tour after that? I did. Um, uh, was on the uh, USS Honolulu, which was a Los Angeles class fast attack right. and um, uh, plank owner, which is Navy slang for uh, built the boat. And where was she home ported? This was out of uh, Newport News, Virginia. Okay, so here you gra you uh, deployed frequently then to the Atlantic and to the Mediterranean Correct. and that sort of thing. Yep, and then uh, did a tour out of Pearl Harbor on the uh, Bremerton. Wow, you, so you flipped and, uh, around. Uh, flipped sure. around, they, they said, oh, it's all different over there, but it was pretty <laughs> much the same. Yeah, and, it's uh, underwater, it looks the same. But That's right. So uh, what was your favorite port call then? Have you visited both the Atlantic and the Pacific? Well, uh, the recruiters will get mad, mad at me, but they don't give many port calls to the <laughs> submarines. <laughs> I see. I, I don't think they're worried about us. So it's you came to home port back. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Okay. We, uh, 
Uh, we had the Brits visit us once, and that was uh, almost like a home port in itself, <laughs> a, a port call Just itself. Just a party but, itself. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so how did you transition from, from the submarine uh, career into a technical and academic uh, field? Well, uh, First, that this, the essence of submarines, because everybody's interdependent on each other, it's mm -hmm. quite cross-disciplinary right. on board. And so uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, union lines. You know, right. everybody qualifies everything because you don't want water in the people tank. Exactly. And so uh, when I came to NPS, it was as a student mm -hmm. to work on computer science. And then I was able to continue onward as an instructor. Uh, um, teaching computer science in the ops research department. Oh, great. And uh, the Navy was kind enough to let me uh, work in all my free time on a PhD while I was there. So, so you were military faculty, you came here, oh, I'm sorry, you came here as a student. Correct. Transitioned to military faculty Correct. and started working as a PhD. That's right. right. And my wife uh, did the flip side of that. She started on the staff, became a student. We were both active duty Navy. Right. So the Navy's been very good to us. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're very fortunate. So uh, you got your PhD here, is that right? Correct. And then did you transition as part of the faculty uh, at, at the end of your service, or that's how did that work? That's right. I, uh, the Navy was drawing down back right. in 94, and uh, so we both got an offer you can't refuse, early retirement. Uh, but that was okay, because I got to reapply to uh, Naval Postgraduate School to join the faculty. And continue your service as a, and teaching and shaping students. And Correct. Sort of. yeah. So um, what did you do your Ph.D. in? Computer science. Okay, and your dissertation, what was it focusing on? Well, it was um, 92 to 94, 95, so very early days of stuff, but it was actually entitled Virtual World for an Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. Oh. And that's when we had some of our first uh, underwater robots in. Right. And uh, this is fairly obvious when you think about it, but underwater vehicles, robots, submarines, you don't use your eyes down there. You use no. sonar, you use other sensors, and, and motion is very counterintuitive. It's always slipping sideways or going where you didn't quite expect. Sure. And so... Because the water column is not the air column. <laughs> it's much right. heavier, and it that's pushes right. harder, and it's got different currents in yes. it. That's right. Exactly. And right. You, could, you can make a case that underwater robots is the hardest domain of all the robots. Because, oh, I think so, yes. Because you can't put eyes on the uh, underwater things where you can with the aircraft or even satellites. Right. Uh, Rephrase the satellite. Oh, that's that's a robot up there, and so uh, just a different kind of one. So the virtual world was, how do we model physics, right? Uh, sonar, visualize what the heck's happening, so we can rehearse what's going on with the robot before you throw it in the water. Because if if you have a mishap underwater with your robot, it's expensive to lose a robot. It right? is, and and you may not even know what went wrong. So this is, this is like a, a physics simulation in a way, uh, with uh, visualization in order to ensure that you can see what's wrong and, and then correct it. Both the software, the plane. You must have read design. that thing. No, you, absolutely you, you, not. <laughs> <laughs> if it didn't have pictures, forget it. I'm not going to look at it. No, well, that's this great. this explains though how you got involved with moves our Modeling uh, uh, and Virtual Environment Institute. So tell us what MOVES is, what its mission is, and what your role in it is. Well, thank you. Uh, MOVES is one of three modeling and simulation degrees in the nation. Mm -hmm. And we started out, there, there was not such a thing. And we found that when we worked on virtual environment types of problems, in other words, the integration, the combination of different technologies running in real time and letting people actually see it and poke it, um, we needed a little more than the computer science curriculum because right. uh, uh, it was always a hybrid of the core computer stuff with something else. Sure. So ops research, operations research, applied mathematics, big mm -hmm. part of that. How can we do things repeatably and understand it? Uh, I had uh, faculty advisors from mechanical engineering from across the, the school and Frankly, that's one of the cool things about NPS is we put together that hybrid major. And that inter so it's interdisciplinary Very by interdisciplinary. Uh, almost a default question for anybody in MOOCs is, well, what else do you do? <laughs> because <laughs> right. we are hooking these things together. We think it makes our students really uh, capable in ways that go beyond uh, um, people who only specialize and are very good at what they do. Right. 
but maybe only good at how it connects to something else. We're, we're really trying to tease everything into everything else and make it work together. Well, if you think about it, if you're trying to create a realistic virtual environment, you have to know how the real environment works, That's right. particularly how it interacts with whatever you're trying to uh, simulate. That's right. By very definition, then, it's highly interdisciplinary. Yeah, and you can yeah. see some uh, very funky, well, it's very commonplace. You know, you see, uh, well, uh, fashion models or something wearing right. head-mounted displays with some beatific uh, expression on their right. face of the wonders that they're experiencing. And, uh, and you know, go uh, Ready Player One, great yeah. movie. <laughs> right. uh, but, um, Frankly, the, the hard part of virtual reality is not the virtual. The hard part is the reality. And reality means, for, for most systems, it means physics. Right, exactly. Where is my sensor? Where am I moving? Did I get to where I expected? And, and so some folks are focused on the avatar, the interaction stuff, but for, certainly for robots, can we test them safely? Right. Can we repeat the test? Can we try it in a perfect environment and then try it in a not so perfect bad weather, rough waves, something breaks? How well does the robot do? You really need virtual environments with that kind of rigor in almost every direction. Right. I'm, I'm not saying we're done yet. There's plenty more work to do. Sure. But we're, that problem is starting to yield. Frankly, I think uh, when we get more and more of it on the web and people can just look at it, Mm -hmm. Change it, ask questions, say, hey, what about this? Uh, then you get collective input that's very valuable, sure. Boom, and we, yeah. and then it'll be like a crossroads, uh, the cross-disciplinary work. Well, now you mentioned your research in unmanned undersea vehicles. Is that mm -hmm. the ARIES system that you were talking about, or how, what was your work in ARIES? ARIES was one of our very first vehicle, mm -hmm. and uh, um, it was launched in the uh, NPS swimming pool, back <laughs> okay. when we had a real so swimming we, pool. We, we, we had depth to it. They got an admiral yeah. and a bottle of champagne <laughs> and the whole nine yards. So and, is that uh, right? We christened right. it. I'll be right. Admiral Ralph West. Yeah. And, uh, and then um, we had a mishap with that. We we got our first network card, and it was we were like, oh, look, we can get all this data. And so they started running experiment after experiment after experiment, and uh, Whereas before, we had always brought it back to the surface and uncorked it and right. plugged in the connector. To and get download. the download. Right. right. It just kept running and running. And suddenly, kaboom, it exploded underwater oh. and sank. And uh, the batteries gave off hydrogen gas. Right. And nobody had calculated for that much. You know, submarines are calculating that every 15 <laughs> minutes or so. Uh, uh, so uh, we rechristened it uh, Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> because and it came again from the ashes. That's right. That's we right. had to throw out all the electronics, but an auto repair shop in Salinas uh, fixed the hull for us, yeah. aluminum hull, and we, we got it back in the water about a year later. Now, uh, in a previous segment, uh, we had uh, Dr. Philip Pace, and he was talking about electronic warfare and the importance of that and, mm -hmm. and intercepts and that sort of thing. Uh, your, another area of your research is something called mm -hmm. network optional warfare, specifically to try to limit the transmissions of communications related to command mm -hmm. and control and communications uh, specifically to minimize intercept and try to increase the robustness of the fleet. So tell us a little bit about how network optional warfare started, what it is, and what you're doing today. Very good. The network optional really came out of my submarine experience where we, submarines could do a lot of things. They don't talk a lot about <laughs> No, that's because you're underwater. Yeah, that's they're right. called a silent service. That's right. So we figure out what you need to do, plan it out, and then go, execute, and only talk when you really need to. And as I look at our fellow Navy folks in the surface fleet and the air fleet, uh, and uh, et cetera, there's an awful lot of communication going on, that's an right. awful lot. It and can be intercepted. It's right. That's and, right. And if the other guy always knows where you are, that's not very safe. No, right. It's, and so covertness is very important. And so we just started scratching our heads and saying, how do, how do we do less of that? And we sort of nibbled away at the problem for years and years, a bunch of different theses, not knowing quite what the organizing principle was. And uh, there's a famous principle in uh, naval warfare for about a couple decades now called network-centric warfare. Right. Admiral Sobrowski, I think, started Bingo. That. Exactly yeah. right. Art Sobrowski. And um, that was, how do we get ships and aircraft to talk together? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very good thing. 
So uh, one of the privileges of my job is uh, being able to brief other faculty. One of them, Wayne Hughes, right. Captain Wayne Hughes, famous guy. One day he interrupted me. He said, Don, you're talking about network optional warfare because he recognized that the ability to communicate optically or efficiently compress messages so you're saying less or even having a common signal book mm -hmm was different, that we were taking away that vulnerability, that need to always be reporting, always and communicating, saying, mother may yeah. I. Right. Um, I like to think back, uh, well, there, just a few years ago, there was a Russell Crowe movie, uh, uh, Master and Commander. Oh, yes, absolutely. The subtitle of that movie was Far, Far Side, Side of, of the, the World. World. That's right. right. <laughs> and uh, because they were, they That's were right. out there and the commanding officer, and that ship, boy, they, they were in charge of their destiny. So this network optional notion is not so new. Right. Uh, of it's course that, in fact, it's relearning things that we knew and used in the past. Here we go. Right. So, so that's been a steady guide for us as we try to apply new technologies and just proper prior planning sure. in many cases. This is rippling forward. Uh, we've even seen how knowing what orders you're giving them and getting stuff done in advance might let us have better ethical control of unmanned systems. Sure. So that when you launch scouts, flying vehicles, other vehicles, and they're out in harm's way so the sailors don't have to be, maybe we can tell them in advance so that they can stay out of trouble, not, not do the things that really only humans should be in charge of, the war fighting parts. Now, we only have a couple of minutes left, and I want to talk about your local contributions as well, because there are. Uh, you were a board member of C-Lab Monterey and helped stand mm -hmm. that up. So tell us a little bit about that program. Yes, that was really interesting because it was a bootstrap, meaning yeah. we pulled ourselves up to figure it out. How do we get kids in right. a camp-like experience education with science? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it turned into a camp rather than a rotating road show. And who, did you just do that yourself, or who sponsored it? That? Was, uh, it ended up being sponsored by CSUMB. Oh, wonderful, sure. It, it had uh, participants from all around the Monterey Bay Crescent and mm -hmm. two dozen research institutions and formed this thing that's still going strong today. Great place for people to send their kids. Science, education, adventure. And it's still uh, going on every year? That's right. So that's right. look out for that advertisement People to make sure should. kids go it's to super the Sea Lab Monterey. That's, that's fantastic. Right. So there's one other thing. We are in a studio today, the AMP uh, studio, and you had, in, in a way at the beginning, uh, help with that uh, uh, stand up. So how did you do that? Well, uh, uh, guilty as charged, uh, uh, Fred Cohn, City of Monterey, was the city manager back then, and he recognized how important AMP was, and that we had a major opportunity when the cable contract was getting renegotiated. Right. So he reached out to NPS. We were redoing our network at the time, and so I was able to contribute saying, well, here are the technical things we want. Let's get fiber to the home. Let's negotiate. We got a, a good consultant. We right. got a great board. We organized this whole principle of uh, public access and uh, I had to go off to other things, but so happy to see AMP still here today. It's, a, it's such a major contribution to the community. Well, uh, Dr. Don Brutzman, thank you very much for your service, both in the Navy and your continued service at MPS, and your local service as well. And thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for joining us for this segment of the Your Town Television Program, sponsored by the Naval Post Graduate School Foundation. Join us again for future segments where we'll talk about uh, our interesting faculty and students and what they're doing for our nation.